affirmative action has become an instrument for shutting down everything but a very narrow kind of stylized code of what you are allowed to say. They have become the, uh, the club for enforcing woke orthodoxy. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you are listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. For a lot of people, the phrase cancel culture is still a theoretical concept. They know it refers to people being punished in various ways for saying things others don't want to hear, but they have little personal experience of it. Indeed, up until not all that long ago, the idea of being canceled was something that was largely limited to the rarefied world of academia. College campuses were the beachheads for those seeking to spread toxic ideologies about intersectionality and critical race theory. Inevitably, that meant that they were also the places where intolerance for differing opinions incubated from an outlier position into mainstream practice. We got used to seeing stories about colleges canceling appearances from guest speakers whose views on a variety of subjects might offend someone. The offended parties were almost always left-wing students, often egged on by leftist professors who considered the enunciation of opinions they deemed beyond the pale to be unacceptable. We were told that hearing ideas that challenged these students' pre-existing opinions and prejudices would trigger them, causing them to feel harm or to be in danger. H.L. Mencken, the great skeptic and cynic of American journalism, once defined Puritanism as the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. The woke left has embraced its own brand of rigid orthodoxy in which they are haunted by the idea that someone, somewhere, may be questioning their ideas about race, gender, government power, and above all, about whether open debate about these issues should be tolerated. But dust-ups about guest speakers at colleges have now morphed into ongoing controversies about institutions of higher learning and whether they ought to allow those guilty of wrong think about affirmative action or the notion that America is an irredeemably racist nation to continue teaching. Social media, which was once believed to be the method by which free speech would proliferate even in repressive nations and cultures, became the vehicle for detecting and then enforcing violations of the new orthodoxies. For example, in 2017, University of Pennsylvania law professor Amy Wax, a noted Supreme Court litigator and expert on social welfare law and policy and also a medical doctor, fell afoul of cancel culture for co-writing an article in which she lamented the price Americans were paying for the breakdown of the country's bourgeois culture. In it, she spoke of the destructive consequences of the welfare state and linked the growth of a variety of social pathologies to the decline in belief in the importance of hard work, decorum, patriotism, and stable two-parent families. Most importantly, she pointed out that not all cultures are equal, or at least not equal to preparing people to be productive in an advanced economy. The willingness of opinion leaders in popular culture to champion multicultural grievance polemics had, she said, had real consequences in terms of the actual harm done to society. For this, she was roundly denounced at her own university, which had repeatedly honored her for her teaching, as well as throughout the academy. But rather than stay silent, she's continued speaking out in defense of the Western canon, as well as about the truth about affirmative action policies. She's therefore routinely denounced as a racist and white supremacist, and the University of Pennsylvania is reportedly trying to figure out how it can legally punish or fire her. Ilya Shapiro, another legal scholar, was suspended at Georgetown University Law School earlier this year for, as he conceded, a poorly worded tweet in which, like many Americans, he questioned the wisdom of President Joe Biden's commitment to only consider a black woman for a Supreme Court appointment. That prompted some Georgetown law students 
to pressure the university to not only fire him, but to provide them with a safe space where they could cry about Shapiro's apparent heresy. The school's sixth month investigation into Shapiro's tweet ended when it concluded that since he had not yet begun work at the university when he posted it, he could not be punished. Though reinstated, Shapiro soon resigned, saying that his employer's unwillingness to defend his right to state his opinions meant that it had bowed to a progressive mob and ensured that he would have to keep silent in order to avoid being put through another such ordeal. At Princeton University, noted linguist Joshua Katz was fired, supposedly over a past violation of school policy, for which he had already been punished, but really about his willingness to criticize the moral panic about race that spread throughout the country during the summer of 2020. The school branded him a racist for questioning the Black Lives Matter movement, and after a prolonged attack from so-called progressives, it succumbed to the pressure to purge cats. While these cases have attracted national attention, they are just the tip of the iceberg. The dynamic here is that even when the abandonment of free speech policies is criticized, those who might think of emulating the victim's courage in contradicting fashionable opinion are still deterred. Few people can risk the financial consequences of losing a job over their desire to speak the truth, let alone the grief and trouble that go with being the object of a cancel culture mob's rage. The net result of these controversies is that free discourse is not merely chilled, but is effectively suppressed. Examples like Wax, Shapiro, and Katz are notable largely because few of those who might agree with them would be willing to risk the perils of following in their footsteps. Nor are universities the only places where people can get canceled. And rather than the cancel mob's fury being directed solely at conservative, they have grown bolder in recent years. Part of the way this plays out is in the way that large companies like Amazon cancel authors and books which call into questions the new orthodoxies about race and gender. It also affects journalism. In 2020, the New York Times fired an editor for choosing to publish an opinion by article by Senator Tom Cotton that called for action to halt the Black Lives Matter riots. Another editor, Barry Weiss, soon resigned over what she termed the intolerable pressure that stemmed from a woke Twitter mob in the paper's newsroom determining policy. The chilling of speech has even spread to the sports world where last week Jack Del Rio, an assistant coach of the National Football League's Washington team, was fined $100,000 for a tweet in which he wondered why the Black Lives Matter riots were not being investigated by Congress and dismissed the Capitol riot as a dust-up. The team denounced Del Rio for expressing a political opinion that they disagreed with, and with a financial penalty they exacted, they made it clear that no one on the team or in a similar position elsewhere, should dare to publicly express a view that wasn't in line with that of the woke establishment that currently rules in most boardrooms as well as in professional sports. It doesn't matter whether you agree or not with Del Rio's opinions about riots or believe that the opinions expressed by Wax, Shapiro, and Katz were correct. What matters is that a critical mass of American institutions across the board have abandoned the right, the idea that the right to freedom of expression should be respected. It's true that there were always some constraints on discourse, especially in the private sector. But the general assumption that governed American public life was that restrictions on free speech were dangerous, not just because they were wrong in and of themselves, but because people understood that silencing one point of view would inevitably lead to shutting up others, including themselves. What's so different and dangerous about contemporary cancel culture is that it is an enforcement mechanism employed by one side in our political battles, the woke left, which no longer believes in that concept. Having come to see politics as a zero-sum game, in which those who question racialist thinking can be branded as evil racist, woke mobs on campuses, in newsrooms, or on Twitter have no compunction about demanding purges in the name of expunging and expelling those who question their ideas. The implications of this development are obvious. 
Without open discourse, democracy is a sham. And if those who question the CRT or BLM movement, which provides a permission slip for anti-Semitism because Jews are assumed to possess white privilege, are canceled, then that means that those who champion these toxic ideas are often given impunity in the same forums, essentially granting a permission slip for anti-Semitism and Jew hatred. A country where cancel culture has become pervasive is not a safe place for democracy or Jews. More to the point, speaking against this trend can't be just a matter for the courageous few who are willing to risk cancellation. Unless and until this trend is confronted and defeated, not just in the public square, by holding universities who allow it to run rampant accountable, free speech will be a thing of the past. And now to our interview of the week. In analyzing the way that cancel culture is impacting democracy and the ability of ordinary Americans to speak up about a whole range of issues, it's important to understand how it operates and who it targets. While marginal fingerers operating on the fever swamps of American politics once considered the only people who could get canceled. We've now seen how even respected scholars who question woke orthodoxies can be just not challenged, but essentially marginalized, shunned, and sometimes fired from their jobs. Our guest today is someone whose glittering resume did not protect her from this process. Her story is not just an object lesson in how cancel culture works, but in how discourse about important issues is being shelved out of fear of offending woke sensibilities. Amy Wax is a professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, a medical doctor who is a trained neurologist. Professor Wax studied both law and medicine at Harvard University. She served in the office of the Solicitor General of the United States, arguing cases before the Supreme Court. She is also an expert in social welfare law and policy, as well as in the relationship of the family, the workplace, and labor markets. Amy Wax, welcome to Top Story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. Um, I want to start by asking you to go back to 2017, to the article that seemed to first bring down the ire of the cancel culture mobs on you. Can you tell us how and why you decided to co-author that piece about the price that society is paying for the collapse of what you termed, you and your co-author termed bourgeois culture. And did you anticipate um, that it would have such a strong reaction? And what is it, do you think, about that argument that touched such a nerve for the woke left? Well, um, I... It wasn't initially my idea. It was my co-author Larry Alexander's idea, and he wrote the first draft. Uh, but since I had written uh, other things in scholarly uh, outlets on similar topics, he invited me to co-write. I basically liked the idea. I made some suggestions for the piece. I didn't give it a whole lot of thought. Um, we placed it in the Philadelphia Inquirer pretty mm -hmm. easily. Uh, and then there was this bizarre uproar um, about it, which I have to confess to you, I, I struggle to understand the woke mentality, which is very mm -hmm. foreign to me, everything that's happening in our society, the, um, the changes that elites are spearheading and the way we think about things are strange to me. Uh, so I, I can't really give you a full account of why there was an uproar about it. Uh, it, there, it was comic in a way. What I found particularly uh, comical about it or ironic is that um, many of the people, my fellow faculty members and, you know, of course, administrators who are burgeoning in number uh, at the law school and at the university, they live impeccably bourgeois lives. They are much more likely to be married. Uh, they tend to move out to expensive neighborhoods, very uh, undiverse neighborhoods mm -hmm. very often, places I call whiteopias. Uh, they, they live in many ways the 50s bourgeois dream. They obey the law. They uh, 
you know, they, they're devoted to their children. Um, they work hard. Uh, so they follow the script, the bourgeois script, and yet they find it outrageously offensive that someone would recommend following that script and attribute a lot of social troubles to the failure to do so. Um, can sure, I fully please. explain that? No, I think it's very strange. Uh, it's hard for me to take it seriously, but because I came in for an enormous amount of criticism, uh, I, I had to mm -hmm. take it seriously. Uh, somehow people found it racist and a white supremacist and, you know, arrogant and unfeeling and offensive and threatening and all of the, that terminology we're now familiar with now that wokeism has taken over our universities and also marched through other institutions. So I, that's a long-winded way of saying that, yeah, I was blindsided by the reaction, but it was a harbinger of of developments uh, in our political and cultural lives uh, and, you know, the beginning of uh, some really disconcerting trends that have, if anything, just gotten worse. Yeah, I think that's very true. We've certainly come a long way in the five years since that article was first, um, was first published. Um, and I imagine that the liberal editors at the opinion section of the Philadelphia Inquirer, who are, of course, uniformly, you know, on the left themselves, did not think that they were doing anything that outrageous by publishing an article that just basically told people, you know, do the norm, do things that we would have normally, we would have thought perhaps before this were just normal. You know, as you say, obey the rules, um, better outcomes. Well, make your life yeah, do the things that, that make mm -hmm. your life better uh, and are widely acknowledged to make your life better. But I think that whole idea that you yourself, through your choices and your behavior and your habits, can make your life better is one that has become extremely unpopular. Actually, the, the editor who did accept the piece, who has become a friend of mine and is no longer at the Philadelphia Inquirer, he was forced out because he was too middle of the road and not woke enough. And I think he was blindsided as well. He never quite recovered from uh, the reaction. Although, ironically, that piece got more hits on the internet than practically any other op-ed that had appeared before. Yeah, and that. probably still is. Uh, you know, it's got a long shelf life. But, you know, sort of to put one's finger on it, I, I think you, 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 you say something very interesting where you said, well, this is, this is the way everybody thought that you had to get ahead in life, no matter who you were. But by placing the responsibility on the individual, you have offended, you, you did offend sort of woke sensibilities, because whether intentionally or not, you were telling the audience that their race, uh, their group identity did not determine their fate. And that was not the most important thing about them. Now, I have to say, if you and I were having this conversation five years ago, I don't know that either of us would have anticipated um, how much the sort of racialist thinking, um, which came to the fore, especially in, in the summer of 2020 with, after the death of George Floyd and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, and the mainstreaming of things like critical race theory and intersectionality, but that is now a very controversial thing to say, isn't it? Yes, I mean, it's almost unacceptable in the academy to doubt the narrative of structural and mm -hmm. systemic racism in particular, but even more broadly, structural and systemic factors as the critical ones, indeed almost the exclusive ones, uh, feeding into misfortune uh, along many different parameters and categories. So it's not just blacks, but it's any people of color. It's women, it's, um, you know, people who are poor, except of course, you know, white people because of their privilege are generally exempted from this. Indeed, I joke with people that the only people who are responsible, who are held responsible as full human beings in the world are white males. Unfortunately, they're responsible <laughs> for everything. 
uh, yeah. including everything bad. So that's the good news and the bad news. Um, but I think the whole notion of personal responsibility is under attack. I call it the exoneration project, that the elites have been engaged in this long-term project of uh, seeing people as kind of puppets on a string, as unable to alter their fate, uh, to make their lives better because the structural forces overwhelm them. And so they can't be blamed, they can't be held responsible. And of course, nothing critical uh, or negative can be said about them if they belong to these myriad sort of protected groups and various categories, which have only multiplied in our society and been made worse by multicultural ideology, by the rise of many different um, ethnic categories through immigration. I mean, we've become this kind of polyglot boarding house. Uh, and of course, the flip side of that is this enormous attack on quote unquote whiteness, which is really just, you know, our formative European traditions and mindset and idea, ideas and ideals. Those are under a cloud. Hence, the bourgeois values that we brought from uh, our European origins and specifically our Anglo-Protestant formative origins for this country, which reigned supreme uh, as authoritative for a very long time until they were recently deposed, not, I think, to good effect in my mind. But in just, you know, in, in holding that opinion, I am now a sort of enemy of the people and certainly within academia, I mean, academia has doubled down, tripled down on uh, not accepting people like me at all and our descent from the dominant views. So it's, yeah, the past five years or so have just gotten worse incrementally. Yeah, I think there are, a lot, there are a couple of different layers to this that I'd like to sort of get into. On the one hand, you know, this is in part about the Western canon, which I think sort of the study of the American Academy, the whole purpose of the university experience was to educate Americans um, in this manner. I mean, that's, it sort of attacks the very you know, foundation of um, these institutions, which are now you know, basically declaring you and, and anybody who agrees with you as a non-person. The other layer to it is sort of the personal way, the the way sort of cancel culture, and mo you know sort of and sort of uh, mobs, whether you know progressive mobs, whether you know on campuses of students who are or express outrage and administrators who bow to them, or on Twitter, or really in just about any you know um, line of uh, you know uh, of endeavor lately, um, you've, even football coaches are getting canceled for saying the wrong things on Twitter, as we've seen in the last week. Um, this is much bigger than ac the academy. If we were having this conversation a few years ago, we would say, well, this is this is sort of an academic thing. Uh, people, you know, we know about all the stories about speakers being canceled and um, students and faculty being unwilling to listen or hear opposing opinions, but it's, it's really, like, like so many other things, this has spread from the campus to the public square, hasn't it? Yes, so I think it's, I forget who said it originally, but I think it might be Andrew Sullivan, although he may have just repeated it. We all yeah. live on campus now. Um, so I think it was possible back in 2017 or 16 to say, well, this is just, a quirky set of extremes, you know, the pointy-headed pointy -headed Ivory Academy uh, puts forward, but society is, is centered and sensible. Well, uh, that is no longer the case. The long march through the institutions has uh, gone very, very far, and now the media entertainment, uh, the nonprofits, the big corporations, um, journalism, uh, the teaching profession generally, and not just in universities, and certainly the universities, have adopted this pernicious cluster of ideas and practices that proceed from what I saw in 2017. And the, the kind of abject, uh, uncritical catering to the untutored um, 
reactions and hysterias of students is really a very important corollary to this. I've seen this over and over again. I see it in my dean who just prostrates himself before the least, uh, the least sort of measured and, and thoughtful elements, that the most activist extreme elements of the student body. Um, and also, you know, of course, minority students, they're treated with kid gloves. Um, and they basically get whatever they want. Uh, but why, you know, why is that happening? Well, part of this sort of neo-Marxist, um, you know, post-European culture, which is highly progressive, part of the, the, the sort of central idea is the past is, is rotten. Uh, it, there's no wisdom there. We need to discard it as quickly as possible. Everything new is better. And as part of that inversion, you know, the authority and the wisdom of old people is to be ignored. Young people are the wise ones. They're the ones who represent the future, progressive ideas. There's a total inversion of, of the usual order of things, um, where the students have to be listened to and the, the older, more uh, educated and authoritative elements in society, uh, they, you know, they need to be discarded and banished effectively. They have nothing to say, nothing to offer. The past has nothing to offer. Um, all of that, I think, is now, you yeah, know, It's sort of like the cultural war. revolution. And you're, you're uh, you know, you and your colleagues are being put through totally. struggle sessions um, for defending what was once normative. And the students call the shots. Yes, the, the students decide what's normative. And the students, of course, I'm sorry to say, they're like students have always been. I mean, they're totally clueless. Um, they need the wisdom and they need the tempering influence of their elders. Um, you know, when they say, well, free speech is just this fetishistic, quirky idea that, you know, we need to get over. Uh, <laughs> I would count on their teachers and their betters to say, no, it's absolutely central to our system, to our American creed, to our democracy. Um, you, you shouldn't be talking about it that way, and here's why. Uh, no, they don't say that at all. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's so old-fashioned. That's yesterday. Um, we, we, don't need dissent. we don't need to tolerate dissenters, especially when they're wrong. And, of course, mm -hmm. we know they're wrong. So those ideas you know, now reign. They dominate on campus. And people like me... Uh, they're really intent upon purging as best they can. There are so few of us left, I think, that uh, it and the ones who are left and who you know speak to me privately in support, they won't speak up publicly. They're afraid. Yeah. To well, I, I think what's there are a couple. There's as I said, there are a lot of layers to this. But you were a person who did not submit to the struggle session. Um, there have been a few other examples, people like Ilya Shapiro or Joshua Katz in Princeton, who has just been fired um, on the pretext of a past indiscretion for speaking up against the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, why didn't you? I mean, wh wh why didn't you sort of just say, okay, I, you know, this, I don't need this struggle, I don't need this, uh, this problem? What was it that caused you to, to basically to defy and, in a sense, double down because you've continued to speak out? Well, I, ne I would never dream of, of quitting or withdrawing or, you know, uh, giving up. I, I would never dream of it. And by saying that, I'm not, you know, being implicitly critical of people like Ilya Shapiro and there are dozens of others I know who have just given up. Or yeah, well, he just, he fire. gave up on, he said, I'm not going to stay at Georgetown to be canceled yeah. at a different date. Right. And he was definitely in danger of being canceled mm -hmm. uh, again and, and pretty much immediately. I think there are a few things going on here. Um, number one, I'm not in the position of, of younger people. I'm, I'm almost 70. I have tenure. I'm coming towards the end of my career. Uh, I am, you know, relatively economically secure. My children are grown. Uh, you know, I'm not in as vulnerable position as some of these other people who have quit the scene or who have settled. 
uh, with their universities are withdrawn. So I'm perhaps the better, best situated of, of all the people I can think of to see it through to the bitter end. Now, having said that, there are plenty of people in my circumstances, senior academics, who are not going to get themselves in the kind of hot water that I have or fight the good fight that I'm trying mm. to fight. So, you know, well, those circumstances don't necessarily dictate um, someone acting the way I do. But the real reason I'm doing it, uh, and this is very telling, is I'm doing it for the young people around me, for my students, for young scholars, for, uh, uh, you know, assistant professors, for fellows, for individuals who don't have tenure, for young individuals who've just gotten tenure. What I don't see much of these days is this sense of obligation to those coming after us. And, you know, I'm Jewish, and I was schooled in this idea of the bris or the covenant, the covenant between future generations, past generations, and present generations, that thread that runs through, that thread of obligation and duty uh, and gratitude and recognition uh, and connection uh, that is so essential to the Jewish faith. And it is also essential to the conservative faith. I mean, mm. Burke, Edmund Burke, who is sort of the father of classical conservatism, he speaks of the tie between the generations and the obligation, um, the, the gratitude towards uh, past generations who have built our civilization, the to, to preserve, protect, and defend that civilization, and its values and its practices, which have been hard won, and for which people have sacrificed for generations, and then the obligation to pass that civilization on to younger people. Uh, he, he spoke in a way of a kind of mm -hmm. bris or covenant that exists. So I take that idea very, very seriously. And it bothers me that other people, even my age, the baby boomers in academia, they're, they're so caught up in their own selfish priorities they really don't seem to feel any obligation to the people who are coming after them. And the reason I'm seeing this through to the bitter end, even though it's, it's painful, it's expensive, it's time consuming, is because of the promises I have made to my students. They have said to me, please don't quit, please don't leave, please don't retire, please don't settle with the university, stick it out. My supporters worldwide, and I get hundreds of emails and phone calls and letters saying, please don't be one of these people who quits. Well, I take that obligation very, very seriously, and I've promised a number of people that I won't. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what's going on. Yeah, I feel duty-bound and honor-bound. Wow. Well, that's very out. well said. Um, let's go back to a couple of the specific issues. You, you've, you've, you've touched on them yourself uh, briefly before. In that original article, you said something that was um, perhaps seemingly anodyne then, but now is, is clearly you know, heretical, when you said that not all cultures are, are equal when it comes to helping people get by in a modern, you know, a developed economy. And you've also uh, touched on the idea of sort of what's happened to this country in terms of becoming, as you, you called it, a polyglot rooming house. Those two things have really gotten the left's hair on fire and intimidated you know, uh, your university and, and others into saying, well, obviously that, that's racist. Obviously that's white supremacist. You know, explain a little bit more about why what you're saying you know, is not racist, you know, and in fact is, is um, something that is very normative, very mainstream, and very much in, in, the, tradition, in, the, in the American tradition. Well, first of all, you'll forgive me if I just don't use the word racist mm -hmm. or white supremacist or any of those ist words. I actually banish those words from my 
Mm -hmm. uh, my seminar on conservative political and legal thought. I said there are a couple of rules in this class, and one of them is you can't right. use the word racist. Uh, and it kind of creates, you know, a lot of clarity because people have to Rather than just it. throwing an epithet, that's, because, of course, that's what that, they're doing. That word has no meaning. I mean, to me, it's just me. I don't even know what it means, frankly. I don't even know what white supremacist is. When I ask people, for example, I ask students who say, well, isn't that white supremacist? I say, do me a favor, define white supremacist and tell me what the heck you mean. Mm -hmm. And they never can. All right. So I'm not going to sit here and try to explain why I'm not a racist. All right. All I'm going to do is and frankly, I don't even care anymore when people call me racist. I mean, it's happened so much that I kind of ignore it, right? Um, I think, you know, what you're perhaps asking me to explain is where I believe that we as a culture and a country have gone wrong. Um, and I guess, you know, I've come to the conclusion that countries are better off, even the United States, which is in a sense quote unquote, a nation of immigrants, right? In the sense that it, it's composed of people who've come from elsewhere and it's a fairly new nation. But the fact is until, let's say the 1980s, this country was overwhelmingly and predominantly European in origin. Uh, European, well, what difference does that make? It makes the following difference. You know, the fact is, in the 20th century, we have post-enlightenment cultures and we have pre-enlightenment cultures. We have the first world and the third world. We have the Western world and the non-Western world. Those are really important divides that have developed uh, in our world global situation. They mean something. They matter, right? We are a first world country and we want to stay that way. So what is it, you know, what are the precepts? What are the commitments? What are the values, practices, and institutions that make us a first world country? Well, we need to ask that question. And we also need to examine the very sensitive issue of the demographic profile of the country that will preserve those elements, okay? Frankly, I think that this country is most stable when it has a European predominance. Yes, you can call that anything you want, uh, but I think a, a dominant culture that is a first world culture, a culture, a Western culture, even I would say an Anglo-Protestant culture in its particulars, uh, is what will preserve what is good and desirable about our country. Now, you know, you can get all up in arms about that because it's culturally chauvinist. It does implicitly imply a pecking order that some cultures are better and more desirable than others. But the very people who are outraged by that idea are voting with their feet. You know, they are seeking out our country. They are seeking out countries that are run by European peoples along, you know, the post enlightenment lines, the democratic lines, the due process uh, and sort of tolerance of dissent institutional lines that we have developed. Um, and they are demonstrating their preference for those systems, for those places. Uh, and, you know, it goes all the way down. It's interesting. I was, this is a bit of an anecdote, and then I'll stop. Um, I was at my husband's 50th prep school reunion this weekend. I won't name the prep school, but it's a very fancy one. Uh, and what I noticed when talking to all of these many people is they're, the ones who are retiring are all retiring to white places. I mean, you know, they're going to New England, they're going to Stockbridge, Massachusetts, they're going to New Hampshire. They're, they're not moving from less, di from, um, less diverse places mm -hmm. to more diverse places. They're moving from more diverse places to less diverse places. They are escaping diversity. So these are impeccably left-wing people, by and large, who will lecture you about you know, what's going on politically and how wonderful diversity is, but they don't live that way. They don't, in their actions, they do not make good on those luxury beliefs, as Rob Henderson would say. So you know, I think people's, actions speak louder than their words 
and their actions say some, some cultures, some civilizations, some environments are more desirable than others. QED. Yeah. What, your, your, critic, uh, your critics um, have answered you know, that argument by saying that America has always evolved. They say, well, uh, 100, 120 years ago, um, the sort of uh, the, the wasp elite thought that uh, Jews and Italians immigrating to the United States would destroy American democracy. That certainly was not the case. And some would make the case that um, you know Latin American immigrants um, can can do the same. Indeed, uh, perhaps Democrats uh, are, are are learning to their sorrow that um, Hispanic voters are not as woke as, as they thought they were on, on many on many issues. Um, do you think that's a valid argument in terms of keeping America less diverse? or having a more skeptical idea about mass immigration, certainly about mass illegal immigration. Um, you know, is, is there a leg to stand on in saying that America can continue to diversify and still maintain um, its Western European culture? Well, we don't even seem to be trying. <laughs> that's very true. I mean, you know, one of, the, one of the things that's gone along with this diversification and also the, the influx of people from you know the non-Western world or the third world has been a wholesale abandonment of the assimilation ideal and the assimilation expectation to this dominant culture. So you know that that has been one of the uh, casualties, shall we say, I think of diversification. Multiculturalism, I think, is a, a very um, nefarious outgrowth of this diversification and that people feel that they need to see every culture as equivalent, that it's some kind of affront or insult to imply that uh, people from X country should assimilate to Y culture, which of course was the way, that was the implicit expectation until very, very recently. So I consider that a, a totally negative trend. Yeah, so I always get the argument, well, you know, people used to have these negative views of past immigration, uh, it didn't turn out as bad as they said, although there were a lot more bumps in the road than people are willing to admit now. Don't get me started on, you know, the whole issue of Jews and whether Jews have been good for society. They've been great in some ways, fantastic, because they're unbelievably talented people. But on the other hand, being a Republican and a conservative, I don't think their influence on politics has been very positive. So it's kind of a mixed bag. You know, I, I think the, the bringing in of all different groups is not an unalloyed, wonderful, you know, uh, thing that's just been terrific in every way. Um, the, the praise, the unalloyed praise of diversity, I just find really silly and childish. But anyway, leaving that aside, you know, the fact that we managed to uh, include and assimilate groups in the past means that we're going to do the same in the future. I think that's a complete non sequitur because the groups of people who are coming in are from de very different backgrounds today, right? So that's number one, and I'll get in a minute to how they are different. And secondly, the economic conditions, the cultural conditions, the willingness to create a melting pot you know, the takeover of, of woke values, that's a very different condition. The sort of global uh, situation um, and the desperation of our lower classes and our sort of middle American, you know, white uh, legacy population is very different. There's so many differences, I think, between the past and the present and the future that we're projecting that we can't say, well, if we could do it then, we can do it now. I just, I just don't see that as following necessarily. So I reject all of that. Now, what do, you know, why, why is it a concern that we're bringing in a lot of people from South America, from the Hispanic South, you know, from Africa, from Asia? Well, let's just talk about corruption, right? I mean, one of the salient features of Western Europe, and especially the Anglosphere in Northwestern Europe, has been very low levels of corruption, a kind of public spiritedness, a norm of public spiritedness and civic responsibility, 
that has taken hold for whatever reason and has been enormously important in creating the wonderful societies that we see in Scandinavia that we saw until recently in the Anglosphere uh, and, and in Europe perhaps more broadly. Uh, and the rest of the world isn't like that at all. The rest of the world is riddled with corruption, with self-regard, with tribalism to an extreme degree. And you know, the question is whether those values are going to come in with the very people who hold those values, or at least you know, their countries and their civilizations exemplify those values. That is a concern. That is a genuine concern that we ought to have. You know, everybody loves to dump on the British Empire and the Raj and imperialism. I get that, colonialism. But the one thing that was said about the British in its empire worldwide was they're not corrupt, okay? They run a good railroad. They're honest when it comes to the administration of government, relatively speaking. That doesn't mean they were perfect, but they were much, much better than uh, many of the administrations that they replaced. So that's just one example, I think, of uh, why we might be wary of bringing in large numbers of people from very different societies. The other concern is, um, you know, and now, well, let's talk about Asians because people have been very critical of me for expressing a little bit of wariness about large influx of Asians. Asians are very capable people, obviously. They have million, many, many virtues. But what they don't have is a culture of liberty loving. I mean, like I talked about free speech as being this kind of quirky fetish that Westerners have or Anglo-Protestants have that they need to get over. Uh, I'm told by my young friends that um, people coming from China and, you know, the girlfriends of these uh, Americans, the Asian girlfriends, their attitude is like, what's the big deal with free speech? Like, why is everybody hung up on this? And I guess I would ask, you know, is it good for our country to have large numbers of people who hold that attitude? Now you could say, well, you know, white people are doing a good job on their own of destroying free speech, right? And there is something to that. There is definitely something to that. Um, but part of the reason they're abandoning it is because it's whiteness. We don't want to impose our culture on other people. You know, that's just the kind of hegemony that multiculturalism abhors, due process. You know, tolerance of dissent, loyal opposition, um, free economies, capitalism, all that stuff. Uh, what makes that better than, than rival systems? That attitude, to me, is scary. It's very scary because we are selling down the river all the aspects of our country and our culture that make it so successful, so prosperous, so desirable. Uh, not sure why we're doing that, but we're doing it. Yes, well, you, you're you're yeah, certainly well, right that you know Americans who are embracing critical race theory, embracing the critique of the United States as an irredeemably racist nature, are, are tearing down their own country. I, I suppose the argument would be right. that if people are coming to this country, craving as I think perhaps many if not most immigrants of past generations did craving democracy craving economic liberty um, that you know that they are you know a good material as it were for preserving american democracy but if they're not asked to sort of pledge allegiance to it and in fact uh, quite the contrary um, you know they're, they're being taught or americans are being taught to think that their culture is not better that that they're their whole way of life is not something to be emulated and to be preserved, then why should we expect anyone, whether they're coming from a country like China, where there is no, uh, where there is no tradition of democracy, and indeed where you know, it's, it's sort of an ethno-nationalist state always has been, why should we expect them to suddenly become advocates of democracy or anybody if we're not doing it ourselves? 
Right. Well, that's very well put. I mean, that I think is exactly what's going on. And, you know, so the elites uh, are, are kind of legacy elites or whatever. The people of influence in our country are abandoning those expectations and those ideals or even repudiating them uh, in a kind of, you know, anti-racist, postmodern, uh, neo-Marxist uh, way, very, very superficial mess of, of ideas. And when, uh, when immigrants come in saying, oh, you have a better system or we, you have a better country, and then we fail to say, but, but here's why we have a better country and here are the practices and ideals and institutions that everyone needs to recognize as critical to that and to support uh, we're not willing to do that, and, and we're, you know, and the question is, why are we not willing to do it? We're trying. We're not willing to do it out of a kind of misplaced uh, mania for equality, that it's somehow an affront to imply that there's better or worse, that that cultures are unequal, or even peoples are unequal in, you know, their interests, their talents, their ability. They have various strengths and weaknesses. We're just not willing to face up to that, so we uh, destroy ourselves. And, and that, I think, is, and it leaves the people who come here, I think, very confused uh, and, and unsure. Um, but they want to, they want to emulate the elites, ironically. Uh, they want to become elite, they want to rise in the world, and so they're going to ape and imitate uh, the attitudes that you know are being handed to them. The other thing I think that's going on is it's very tempting to jump on the multicultural bandwagon if you are from a you know different ethnicity or non-European culture. I won't say non-white because you know uh, racial categories are, are kind of fluid and overlapping in some ways. Um, but if you're a person of color, then you can be a victim. And it's very tempting to take on the role of a victim in our current culture and society because you get all sorts of goodies and extra privileges if you are a victim. So I think it's very hard to resist. It's not that some people don't resist it, you know, Hispanics who vote Republican and just reject that whole woke mentality, who vote for Trump, they in a way are just refusing to turn themselves into victims. But they're still in a minority, you know. As same with Asians, same with Indian Americans. Um, I, you know, I, people say, "Well, why, why are you critical of Indian Americans?" Well, because they're among the highest earning and most successful people, immigrants that we have, and yet they keep complaining about how racist and awful our country is. Of course, ignoring that their own country is is caste conscious, color conscious, corrupt. They probably their efforts would better be exerted to improving their own country, uh, but they insist upon criticizing our country. And that can't be a good thing. That is not going to end well. Yeah, well, you, you speak to the, you know, yeah. to the desire to be a victim. That is, to be a victim is, you know, sort of puts you at the top of the pecking order right now. It's, it's the way our culture works. Um, that's also why you've been subjected to such criticism for your comments, and you're not the only one who comments about the impact of affirmative action policies in the academy and scrutinizing how people perform under them to merely examine the data or to speak of how people do under those circumstances has opened you up to those same charges um, that uh, you know you, you don't want to dignify but have become part of the narrative of this discussion, haven't they? Yes. Well, I mean, you know, I have tried to discuss affirmative action pro and con with people like Glenn Lowry, uh, but, you know, these fragments of what I mm -hmm. say are lifted out of context and then turned into an indictment against me. Um, let me tell you, know, the wor I have come to the conclusion that the worst thing about affirmative action, which is a policy for which there are pros and cons. You know, it's sort of a complicated discussion. And the notion that I'm, you know, I hate affirmative action, I'm unequivocally against it, is really a fallacy. But I have come to 
uh, be against it. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is precisely the way I've been treated. That it has turned into a club to silence people who even want to talk about the facts, who even want to make simple observations about reality. Affirmative action has become an instrument for shutting down everything but a very narrow kind of stylized code of what you are allowed to say. They have become the, uh, the club for enforcing woke orthodoxy. Uh, you can't say anything that might hurt a minority student's feelings or make them feel bad in any way or confront them with facts about how affirmative action works. You can't even suggest that a minority is actually the beneficiary of affirmative action. I mean, there are all of these ridiculous rules about what you can and can't say. And they all come out of this policy of affirmative action. Affirmative action has destroyed the academy in the sense that it has, you know, so narrowed any room for dissent and debate and led to the persecution of people like me. I mean, you know, there's like a 50 count indictment now filed against me at Penn. I spent all my time fighting these charges. They are determined to purge the university of me and people like me. And, you know, all because, because we don't agree with the diversity, inclusion, and equity agenda. We dare to be critical of affirmative action. You know, we dare to state facts about uh, how affirmative action works and what its consequences are. I mean, all of this stuff is now forbidden. If we could have affirmative action, but just let people say what they want about it and about other things, affirmative action wouldn't be nearly as pernicious as it is. Yeah, I think at this point, mm -hmm. it's just poison. one of the you know, sort of one of the key words you, you spoke about equality, but of course the current culture of uh, you know sort of these institutions of diversity, equity, and inclusions, equity is not equality. Equity is the opposite of equality. It's about skewing things through active discrimination in order to get a result that some people think would be more equitable, but it's certainly not equal opportunity, and it's, it's, it goes against the traditional American idea that the individual is what counts, that your group, your, your, your caste, um, which might have determined your fate in another country was not what was going to determine your fate in the United States. And by discarding that, um, it really skews all our discussions, you know, not only about affirmative action and about how minorities are treated, but about how, pe about how people come to this country and become Americans. Um, that kind of throws it in. And I want to relate it back now, just before we, we run out of time, to uh, the question of Jews, you, we've talked about how white privilege is, is the great sin of, of the academy, it's the great sin of cancel culture. But now that Jews, once a despised minority, are now treated as having white privilege, that Israel, the state of Israel, the Jewish state, the one Jewish state on the planet, is treated as a, a, a possessor of white privilege, even though the majority of the Jewish population there is, by the definition of the DEI crowd, people of color because they trace their origins to the Middle East or North Africa. Um, Jews are, in, in, in fact, even though some of them are the, you know, part elements of the Jewish community, even the Jewish establishment are, are great defenders of, of this woke agenda, uh, they are, Jews are really the victims of it. That This is giving a permission slip for anti-Semitism in the form of this critical race theory and intersectionalism that views Jews with disdain as oppressors who must be suppressed. Well, right. So I think, you know, what it boils down to is if you're a persecuted group that manages to be successful anyway uh, by just, you know, working around the oppression, uh, then you're white adjacent. Mm -hmm and you're part of the oppressor class. In order to be oppressed, you have to be 
less successful. So, you know, the perversity of that is just, is just endless. And let me say the other side effect of um, wokeness, DEI, affirmative action, is the wholesale assault on the, on the meritocracy, which is really ultimately what's going to sink us. Uh, as a society, that we're dismantling meritocracy. I could go on and on about this, uh, especially what's happening in, in the sciences and in medicine. But back to Jews. Um, yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> being Jewish, I've always been puzzled by Jews getting behind ideologies like wokeness and, you know, the kind of neo-Marxist uh, offshoots of wokeness. I really don't understand what's in it for them, quite frankly. Uh, it's very hard for them to stop identifying as an oppressed minority uh, because, you know, for a very long period they were oppressed, um, they were discriminated against, uh, but now they've managed to overcome all of that. Um, and so the, you know, the victim class has kind of turned against them, turned against them because they're too successful. Uh, and, you know, the whole anti-Israel thrust, I think, is part of this movement to disdain nationalism, disdain the idea of a dominant identity, of trying to preserve your culture, trying to do it through demographic policies. I mean, all of that, Israel does all of that in spades, of course, um, and they're targeted for it. Uh, so that's part of it as well. Um, so, you know, I'm not denying that, that Jews, you know, have been turned on as, as you know, white, white privileged, being white privileged uh, people. They are white privileged people. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with having white privilege, so I don't see that as any kind of indictment. Um, but it's, it's clearly unfair. Uh, I don't get that excited about quote unquote anti-Semitism, um, why don't I? Because success is the best revenge, that's why. <laughs> because the Jews are, you know, very successful to the extent that I think that their star is fading, and I do think it is. I think it's self-inflicted. Um, they have, you know, instead of their kids going into the professions and sciences and, and the like, they're going to film school. I mean, it's push cart to push cart in three generations, right? But that's, that's sort of the natural evolution of an ambitious immigrant minority as they become more successful. Uh, so there's, that, there's not a lot we can do about that uh, except point it out. And then there's intermarriage, of course, which um, has uh, changed the profile of Jews in this country. Um, so, you know, I think the Jews are in a complex situation. Um, but they, I think they're, they're so successful and they're so wealthy and they're so influential and they are very, very influential in the opinion shaping institutions um, that they just haven't gotten that excited about uh, the anti Semitism that exists. It hasn't really affected their lives. I think when it does, and if it does, then that will. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, most well, Jews certainly don't wear, walk around wearing a sign on their, around their, on their back saying, I'm a Jew, therefore I am different. But without the meritocracy, right. which you referred, which is sort of the key to American success, but it's also the key to Jewish success in this country. Um, you know, if, if, if America is no longer a meritocracy or a meritocracy is being discarded, um, the whole, and if, uh, you know, I ideas which sort of target Jews or, or treat them as, you know, the other or as somehow as, as despised as the, uh, the dreaded uh, wasps, um, then certainly it endangers not only their future, but also their ability in some cases to preserve their security because without the things that have made America, America, the Jewish community in this country, which is sort of uniquely history, uh, uniquely successful in the in the history of the diaspora, just doesn't happen and can't continue. I'll tell you one thing that really puzzles me, and I, I would like to see how it evolves. Is I mean, I have three children, uh, one son, two daughters, and I am surprised and I am amazed that Jews are pushing these equitable policies, which are, of course, anti-meritocratic, 
in every possible way, um, pushing these policies when they are directly hurting their own children. They are directly hurting their own children. So, you know, take uh, Jewish sons and to a lesser extent daughters who uh, are well equipped to and want to go into academia, which is a place where Jews tended to gravitate in the past, um, their opportunities are so diminished to get those jobs now, uh, practically nil, frankly. I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult to get hired as a white male um, and Jews are considered white males, no matter how talented you are and how good you are um, in your field. Uh, and so you would think that Jewish parents would be very upset and up in arms about this because it's having a concrete effect on their own children's opportunities. Um, and, you know, I know young people, Jewish and other uh, non-minority young people who recognize that they are being shut out. They are being totally shut out. You know, why they're not uh, up in arms and rebelling against that, I, I do not understand. Uh, because, yes, they are being directly yeah. harmed. Well, I it. think um, well, fashion, you know, uh, the power of fashion, the power of fashionable ideologies is, is, is almost, uh, uh, you know, indomitable in today's society and uh, certainly in a country where free speech is on the decline, whether if you're talking about big tech or, you know, as I say, the cancel culture has migrated from the academy to the public square, um, the willingness to stand up against these things, even when your own interests are at stake, um, requires a sort of a, a very different mentality than I think many of us have. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really quite shocking. And I just wonder, you know, what would shake these people out of their their doldrums uh, of seeing how it's harming them them directly. I mean, maybe it's that you know Jews just aren't having that many children. I, I don't understand it, frankly, uh, and I'd like to see it change, um, but hasn't yeah. changed. Well, it's yet. certainly a self-destructive tendency, uh, Professor Wax. I want to thank you for coming on. We, I think we barely scratched the surface of some of these issues. Perhaps you can come back uh, at a later date and we can go even further into it and, and we'll trace your own uh, battles uh, along these lines and um, see how you're doing. We also want to thank our audience, uh, whether you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms, watching us on Facebook or Twitter or on the JNS YouTube channel or on JBS TV. Please like and or subscribe to Top Story and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at jns.org. Let us know where you listen and watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>